Good evening, church family. Looking forward to this opportunity that we have to spend this time in God's Word together. Of course, not only being able to fellowship with you by the only means that we have now, I still account it a joy, a privilege, an excitement of each time that we're given this opportunity. Also, once again, on behalf of our church to our special guests, uh, we want to extend a welcome to you. We know you had this choice and we're so glad you make it to spend this time with us. Uh, we encountered a privilege and an honor when we have people join with us around the Word of God. And our purpose at Tabernacle Baptist Church is to let you know that God loves you. We love you. Let you know that God has some wonderful things for you. First of all, if you're not saved, uh, we want you to know that God loved you so much that Christ came not to condemn you, but that through his death and burial resurrection, you could be saved. You could be saved. To the believer, uh, God loves you so much. Uh, he's given you that which you need to be able to grow in grace and knowledge and to become uh, the disciple uh, that God intends you to be. We never want to forgive that Jesus said, I came to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. Now that's taken out of context. That's not being healthy, wealthy, and wise. That abundant life means a life that, that you can be assured that God is in charge, that he will protect and provide. Very plainly, he states in Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, salvation, salvation. And all these things will be added to you. And if you'd read the previous verses, you would find that every need that we have, God has promised to meet that need. That's why, even though we're in this pandemic time, we're in this chaotic condition, we should never forget that God is sovereign. God's in charge. This is not caught him by accident. This is not beyond his control. I would like to institute, it's just my persuasion. But you know, Peter talks about judgment must, must first begin at the house of God. And then what will the righteous do? I personally believe that God is purging his church. He's purging his church. He's finding out who's genuine. He's finding out who, like the mixed multitude that came out of Egypt, is just along for the blessings and the identification with the people of God. He's finding out real quickly, ladies and gentlemen, who are those that love him, who are those that have made a commitment and will continue that commitment. He's purging the church that he might find those Regardless of the circumstances, they're still going to maintain their convictions. They're going to maintain their loyalty. They're going to maintain their devotion. They're going to continue to worship God. Sure, we all long as believers, true believers, to fellowship one with another in the house of God, to be able to hug each other and shake each other's hand and to hear the testimonies from each other. But God is sending his church. And you remember what he said? Judgment must first begin at the house of God. What's that telling us? We wouldn't have allowed this to come to pass. It's taking place right now. God's house would have been what it ought to be. The Bible tells us very plainly, even individually, we need to get our own house right before we try to tell somebody else how to get their house right. And I believe that. I believe God is purging his church. I believe he's separating the mixed multitude. Those come for the sense of being identified with him. But they've either never really been saved. Or they've never really made a commitment. They've either never been to the cross. Or they've never left the cross. And grew in it. 
Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. God, and listen to us, because he's purging, we need to realize he knows exactly who we are. We might could confuse others. We might could hide from others. Just because we come to a local assembly and assemble ourselves in the church and sing the songs and listen to the messages, uh, that doesn't put anything to proof other than we're faithful to church. The real proof is, are we being conformed to the image of Christ? You see, God left us in the world, but not of the world. And I think God is purging once again his house. And I think a test that we're going through is a test of patience. Patience. Will we continue to serve God until he opens the doors of his house? Till he allows the whole church, not just a handful, and I'm not minimizing that handful, and I'm not judging you. I'm just saying from my own perspective, I believe God is testing our patience to see if we'll trust him to work out this pandemic according to his will, or bring about the changes that he wants to brought about, and to purify his people, to purge his church, and to bring a revival that only he can. So I want you to turn with me to James chapter 1 and verse 4 as we look at the subject of patience. Now I'm the first to admit patience is not my favorite test that God puts me through. It's not a favorite test in this generation at all because we're a three-minute society. We forget that we're not the only one when we go to eat somewhere, when we pull into a, a gas station or something, lines infuriate us because we forget we're not the only one. But when it comes to the things of God, patience is a virtue. And the Bible tells us that, that patience, patience causes steadfastness and steadfastness causes hope. But look what James says. But let patience have her perfect work or her complete work. Her complete work. You see, you or I can never be what we ought to be for God unless we learn to wait for God to work in our lives. How much regret do I or do you, even as a believer, have because patience was not exercised and an emotional or prideful decision was made and the cost was far more or the detour was longer than we thought and because of the misery that we had to endure because we did not let patience have her perfect work or complete her work that you may be perfect, complete. See, until you, the first method of growth, do you not remember what the Lord said if you wrote, read the Bible? Wait upon the Lord. I say, wait upon the Lord. But, we're so motivated. Now, Lord, I, I can see what I need to do. That's, I've got a better decision, and I don't really have time to wait. Let me tell you something. God's in charge of time. God's in charge of time. Notice what he said. That it may be perfect and entire, complete, totaled. Why? Wanting nothing. Those that learn to wait upon the Lord shall be blessed. Shall be blessed. Look at it. Look at it. What, is, what does patient mean? Well, it means bearing pain 
or trials or calamity without complaint. Uh-oh. That negates a lot of us. Patience means that we will calmly and without complaint wait for the time of God to operate in our life. Now, I would be less than truthful if I told you that's a battle with me. That's a battle with me. I know what God's Word says in my limited knowledge. I've seen what He can do by the experience in my life. And sometimes, sometimes I wonder, why? Why is God waiting? He's sovereign. He has all the answers. But I forget what sometimes we forget in public as there's a line ahead of us. We're not the only one in our life. How many lives will you affect by the decisions you make and by the authority God gives you to follow those decisions? Or how much error will you cause? How much heartache will you cause if you pridefully or self-righteously make a decision without consulting God. The Bible said, what? What? Bearing pains and trials without complaint. It also means steadfast despite opposition, difficulty, or adversity. And the one that would best fit most of us. Now, let me have that liberty. And this is my opinion. Not hasty or impetuous. Guilty. Guilty. But God said very plainly. So what are you saying? Patience literally means to be willing to suffer. It means self-control. It means the ability to wait and not rush into things. Notice what he said. Now, what was, what was the, 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 the ingredient, let me use that word, that caused Moses to be used of God like he was? What caused Job to be the man that he was during all the difficulty that he suffered? Oh, how our hearts breaks if we, we lose one, one loved one. Look what he lost, a whole family. And then he had bodily pain and health problems. Lost his wealth. Lost his wealth, lost everything. But what caused him to be the example and to be victorious in God? What was it? What, what, what caused Daniel to be used of God like he was. Psalms 37, verse 7a. Rest in the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. And wait patiently for him. Moses waited 40 years on the backside of the desert before he answered the call of God. Think about that. Think about that. The Bible says very plainly. What a responsibility Moses had. To lead that. Two million possible people. That murmured. Complained and griped. Unthankful. What did it say? What did it say? Moses was patient through the years. And never quit. Job, God allowed greater trials in his life than any of us have ever had or had to face. But look what Job said in Job 1, 21 and 22. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this God sinned not nor charged God foolishly. 
let me give you right quickly the qualities of patience. By the way, the reason that Moses had patience, the reason that Job had patience, the reason that Daniel had patience, they had been saved. They were children of God. They had looked to the cross where we look back. They had trusted the Messiah who would come one day. They had repented and trusted by faith. Yes, faith is in the Old Testament. It's always been by faith. It's always been through grace. It's always been behind the shedding of blood, even though it was a type in the animals which could not secure it, but was a type to be able to know about it when it happened. Man was never saved by the law. He's always been saved by grace. He's always been saved by the shedding of the blood because all without the shedding of blood is no remission and that blood was the blood of Christ, which was atoned. Look at it. Here's the first quality of patience. The ability to wait. Look at Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Do you know, remember, when Jesus would go up into the mountain alone after a hard day, was to renew his strength. To renew his strength. Child of God, you need to learn to be still so God can renew your strength. We live in such a hurry, hurry, hurry word. I got a this, I got a that. God kind of put a stop to that, hadn't he? Huh? Hadn't he? I'll tell you what, he cut that down in a hurry. He, he stopped us in our tracks. Why? Because we need to be renewed in the strength of God. If we're living for the Lord. We're using that strength in this daily wicked world. That's why we need to be strengthened. We do that by the word of God. We do that by prayer. And you can't do that on the run. You've got to have special time to read your Bible and pray. Notice what he said. They shall mount up with the wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Think about that. You and I need to learn to wait upon the Lord. Now, if it's easy, anybody can do it. But you can't do it except you make a commitment to God. You ask for His grace. You ask for His strength. And you ask for Him to help you. Lord, because to be that complete person, I need the strength of God and I need to, to be still to be renewed. Number two, patience means resignation. What does that mean? What does that mean? We must resign ourselves to the will of God. Patience is understanding that we have a sovereign God who has a plan and purpose in everything that he does. Look at Job chapter 13 and verse 15. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him, but I will maintain mine own ways before him. Look at Luke chapter 22 and verse 42. Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. Have you resigned yourself to God's will in your life? That's patience. That's patience. Remember? Remember what Job said? Let's go back one more time to Job chapter 1, verse 21 and verse 22. And he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. They resigned themselves to understand that the sovereign God had saved them. They were not their own. They'd been bought with a price. They were to glorify God. They, like the three Hebrew children, 
resign themselves to be committed to whatever God called upon them and whatever the results would be all right. Remember what they told Nebuchadnezzar? Our God will protect us. But if we're consumed, so be it. We will not bow to that statue. They resign themselves to trust the sovereign God. He's in charge. It's his plan, his purpose. That's what patience is. God is in charge of my life. And he knows what he's doing. His plan and his purpose is to be given to me in his time. In his time. Not my time. Not my time. His time. And then number three. Patience also means endurance. Endurance. You see, patience is not a sprint. It's a long distance marathon. And the finish line is when we meet Jesus. So life is a marathon for Christ. And we only reach the finish line when we stand before Jesus. Many people will join a church. But only a few will stick it out. Think about that. Think about that. There are countless numbers that make many promises and many commitments with their mouth to see only a few who follow through with them. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me say, I said it in the Sunday morning message. I believe God is purging his house. I believe it with all my heart, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, people are having to prove now. I believe when this is all over, the genuine will return and those that were the mixed multitude will not come back. But that way, when the house is purged and people that are in their church because they love God and because they've committed to God, then God will be able to do something. You see, to have a large number just for the sake of a number, and I'm not against large numbers, so get off my case. Don't jump on me. I wish we were running a thousand genuine. But you remember Gideon's 300? Was what somewhere around 30,000 started out, and when it wound up, when it came time to purge, only 300 stood the test. Think about that. And I believe if and when, God allows the church to come back complete and nothing wrong. If you want a few people coming, you run your church. Churches are autonomous. Preachers are responsible to follow the will of God. Don't you judge a church that's coming back and don't you judge a church that ain't coming back. Every pastor has to give an account to God on his own and every church is autonomous, self-governing. And the church has to make the decision of what it's going to do according to how they feel they're led by God. So don't you get self-righteous. But I promise you, ladies and gentlemen, when it's all said and done, we're going to find only the genuine committed. I don't mean they're the only ones that were saved. Because the Bible tells us very plainly that Nicodemus having, you know, I mean, come. Demas, having loved this present world, is departed unto Thessalonica. I believe he was saved, but he never followed through with his commitment. When he made his commitment, oh, it was up in the glory pine. But when he saw what it was going to cost him, crucifying himself, he went back. And I think that's what happened to the church of Jesus Christ right now. He's looking for the Demases. He's looking for those that the love of the world is going to be renewed by the fact that they've not been faithful to continue to support their church in messages and in gifts and in prayer. And they'll get so used to the world, they won't want to come back. They won't want to come back. Why? Why do we need patience for the long run? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. I have fought a good fight. 
I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. Not to me only, but to all them that love his appearing. Jesus never promised the life of the disciple would be easy. In fact, he said, he that lives godly shall suffer persecution. Don't you remember how over and over and over and over and over he told the disciples, don't be surprised, they hate me. They're going to crucify me. They're going to crucify you. They're going to hate you. They're going to lie about you. They're going to destroy you in any way they can, character-wise or literally physically or spiritually. How many, how many good godly servants have been destroyed by a loose tongue? By a loose tongue. By false information. Oh, listen to me. Jesus said, but he did say that he would never forsake us or leave us. In closing, look at Hebrews 13, verse 5 and 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Oh, listen, if that don't excite you, let me borrow you something from the cathedrals. If that don't light your fire, then your wood's wet. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. Patience. Patience is the test. I believe that God is putting his church his house to today. It's at the top of the list. Patience. Patience. Let patience have a perfect work that you might be complete. Listen to me. Listen to me. You cannot afford to run ahead of God. You cannot afford to run out on God if you're a believer because you'll wind up with regret and a loss that you can't imagine. Christian, I know it's trying times. Believer, I know. But God's in charge. Look what he said. Look what he said. The Lord's my helper. The Lord is my helper. Be still and know that he's God. Be still and know that he's God. Let patience have its complete work so that you can come forth victorious. Stop trying to rush God. Ask him to help you. Be still. And then person under the sound of our voice. If you've never been saved, I'd be amiss if I didn't remind you that you need to be saved. And there's only one way to be saved. The way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by the Son. Christ is not a way. He's the only way. No other name given among men whereby we must be saved. One meter between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So right now, right now say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Save me. I'm trusting you as my Savior. and Make me that new creature. Make me that new person. Help me to be the person that will follow you. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Christian, Believer, the world is getting a stronger hold on you. It's getting a stronger hold on you. Remember, remember what God did? He delivered Lot, but Lot didn't pay no attention. He went right back in. If he saved you and called you out of the world, he done the same for thing for you. He's brought you out. But if you go back, you'll wind up just like Lot did, losing everything. Don't do that. Father, once again, we need the anointing of this message as only you can grant it. Lord, if you don't empower the message, if it didn't glorify you and it didn't lift up Christ and it's not the information the Holy Spirit could use, it would be all in vain. But Lord, we ask you to, to bless your word, to honor your word as you promised. And I ask you to open up every heart for every person that will listen to this message, whether members of our church or not. And they'll understand. It takes time for something to grow. 
It takes patience for you and I to be rejuvenated and to be re-strengthened for the journey called life as we serve it for Jesus Christ. Father, give us that grace because if you don't give it, we won't have it. But you said we have not because we ask not. And so therefore we're asking, help us to be still and know that you're God. Don't let the enemy keep badgering us. But you don't have no faith. You don't have no faith. You don't have no faith. Lord, protect us from him. It's not that we don't have faith. In fact, it's the fact that we do have faith. We've determined to wait until you say it's right. Whatever it is in our life. We ask you now to bless these that will listen throughout the entire week. We'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Until we meet again, let you know God loves you, we love you. Amen.